All right, with any luck, I figured this out. <laughs> Jeez. It seems like the last time I streamed uh, online, uh, the YouTube's uh, settings were different, and you got a chance to figure out what you're doing before you decided to do it. Uh, bottom line is, my name's Charles Morgan. I'm the editor of Coin Week. I'm here with my uh, quarantine haircut, or lack thereof, uh, and Martin Van Buren's sideburns, but uh, I'm not the important part of today's program. Today we're going to talk about uh, Franklin Half Dollars. We're going to talk about full bell line designations and uh, how to identify them. I have some uh, high quality photos that were provided me by NGC. Uh, and uh, the Franklin Half Dollar series, as you can see, I'll put this here for you to look at. Franklin Half Dollar series was struck between 1948 and 1963. It prematurely ended uh, because of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. I think the series would have continued for a while after that. Uh, but uh, the Kennedy half dollar was introduced in haste uh, and released in 1964. It was a one-year type. Uh, the last 90% silver half dollar struck for circulation in 1964. Then after that, it was a silver clad coin until 1971 when it became a full clad coin. But this Franklin half dollar series struck from 1948 to 1963 is the final full 90% silver half dollar series in the U.S. Uh, coin series. So it's a beautiful coin in my opinion. I, I think it replaced the very busy uh, Walking Liberty half dollar, which is in itself an iconic design with a simple, more modern uh, uh, pairing. Uh, the great thing about the series is that it is complex and, and a, uh, a, a great study of it can be made by collectors looking to uh, collect the coin based on the full bell line designation, which is usually what collectors look at as uh, defining whether the coin was well struck or not. It's actually, in my opinion, an incomplete look at the coin because... The bell lines can be there, um, but the obverse can be poorly struck or not as defined as you would like to see. But when we look at the premiums that these coins generate, mostly we're looking at the full bell lines. So here is an example here of a full bell line Franklin half dollar. Um, and uh, as you can see, what we're looking at is a complete line without inner or bisecting uh, uh, scratches, hits, dings, or lack of impression. This is a coin I believe would grade about an MS63. You see, it does have some chatter uh, uh, throughout the coin. And, uh, and what we're looking for is, are the lines on the top and the bottom complete throughout? A little bit of flatness turns out to be okay, as long as the lines are completely there. I'll show you an example here of a similar coin and a similar grade uh, but without the full bell line designation and we can see quite clearly that there is a distinction here so look at this one now when you're looking at the left side of the coin the left of the giant the giant crack you see uh, flatness and an ill-defined uh, lines at the top and the bottom, specifically at the bottom. The bottom isn't there at all. It's almost completely obliterated, not struck up well at all. Let's take a different coin. This is another non-full bell line example. This is a D-Mint. Um, and with the Franklin Half Dollar series, you know what the worst ones are? The worst ones are almost always the S-Mint coins. But here's a D-Mint coin. You see, again, to the left of the crack, Right, we have uh, complete obliteration here at the bottom. You can't make up the lines at all. Uh, and then there's a big uh, uh, line here, a big hit um, that, that cuts through all three of the top lines. And even if the bottom lines were there, I think that, 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 that hit there would probably stop this coin from getting full bell lines. Now, let's uh, take another look at a different coin here. I'll try to blow it up on my screen, share it with you. Um, this is uh, this is a P-Mint. And uh, what we're looking at here, again, 
the bottom lines are almost there. You see, again, to the left of the crack, there is a spot where it's not there. You know, it's just a little, little, it'll define. And then at the top, you have a, a, a hit going through it on the left side, and it's very soft, very softly struck. Uh, and on the right side of the crack, you see another hit that goes through it like a, like a bag mark. Um, so this coin wouldn't make it. And, and actually, I think this coin is probably dipped because you see a little bit of residue. So we know what isn't going to cut the mustard. Let's look at a few coins that are good enough and see if we can kind of spot uh, by looking at them what we're talking about. Because again, it's important for you as a collector, if you're cherry picking coins, to get the coins that have the most value. Uh, this is a MS64 level, uh, Franklin half dollar. And the hits that exist are light, they don't break up the uh, the lines. You see the line extends from the far left of the bell to the crack and, and it is complete. Uh, this is a photo so depending on the way the light is you know it may look like it's dull in some spots but this uh, this coin is a full bell line example. Uh, and this is a, this is a P mint here. Uh, here's another one. Let's grab this uh, picture. This one is photographed from a slab so uh, it, it, um, it has a little bit of that plastic uh, uh, glean glare over it but a uh, fairly good uh, photo. Uh, you do see some some reed marks here but they do not interfere with the lines. The lines go from the left most portion of the bell all the way to the crack. They are complete here and below you see the lines there again are complete throughout uh, and this is an example of a well-struck uh, Franklin half dollar and this is uh, in the MS 65 level so we're getting up to like really nice collector grade coins here and I'm going to show you uh, an MS 66 here and uh, in this MS 66 grade let's see if I can make it a little bit bigger for you so uh, here again, um, we are looking all the way to the left. We're trying to follow those lines all the way to the crack. There's three at the top, there's two at the bottom, and you follow those lines all the way across. The, where you're gonna get the most trouble is always gonna be on the left of the crack. Like if the coin is not gonna hit full bell lines, it's probably gonna be because of this portion of the coin. And so uh, anytime you're cherry picking an uncirculated example uh, that's in the raw or even some that are in the holders, you want to just start at the left of the bell, follow the line across, and see if you can hit that marker. So what are the Franklin half dollar examples that you want to get uh, in full bell lines? What are the ones that are hard to get? And uh, let's let's take a quick look at that and see if uh, we can we can spot any uh, any places where you definitely are going to make some money if you can cherry pick the coins. So I'm uh, basing my uh, readout here on uh, what NGC is reporting uh, in their uh, online price guide, and uh, uh, I'm you know no particular reason why I'm using that versus any other price guide, and I'm not really going to sit here and quote prices because the prices can be variable based on toning, um, uh, whether the coins have a CAC sticker, uh, you know, what, what auctions they appear in and whatnot. But uh, we're looking at when the series starts, okay, in 1948, the P mints, which uh, tend to be a little bit better struck than the D mints, you're looking at a, a differential of about 40 or 50 bucks up to 65 in full bell lines. So full bell line, 1948, Franklin half dollar, fairly common. A 66 is a scarce coin in both full bell line and not full bell line designations, but they're more or less equivalent in price. And then once you get to 67, you're talking about very few coins, a few thousand dollars uh, example. Uh, the 48 Ds are a little tougher. They're not much tougher, but they're a little tougher than the 48s to find in gym. 
And again, there's not much of a differential between the 48Ds and full belt lines and not. You're looking at hubs that are fresh, uh, dies that are fresh for the most part. So you can you can get a nice one. A year later, uh, again, still very easy to find a gem and 65 with full bell lines. Not much of a spread, but once you get to 67, super tough. I think a full bell line 49 uh, uh, is uh, going to be double what a non full bell line example would be. So very scarce coin. Now when we get to the D mints, the D mints here, this is this is where it gets a little harder. Uh, we're looking at about a four to five hundred dollar coin in 65 with a slight 20% premium once you get to the uh, once you get to the uh, full bell line designation. 66 is uh, conditionally rare. The 49S is uh, hard to get full bell lines and uh, so if you're looking at a 65 costing about 100, 150 bucks, you're gonna be looking at about four hundred dollars for the uh, for the full bell line version at 65 and then it gets harder and harder once you go up to 66 and 67. Going to 1950, again, P mints, easy to find, full bell lines, especially in gym. You're looking at 145, 150 bucks for regular, 170, 180 bucks for full bell lines. Of course, going beyond 65, you start getting into higher tier coins. Uh, 50 Ds, about twice as hard to find full bell lines than the uh, than the 50s, I would say. Uh, and then uh, you get to the 51 Ps, still pretty easy. Although the full bell lines are a little tougher here. You can get a nice gym 51 for under 100 bucks, but you're gonna pay between two and $300 for a full bell line. 51 Ds are uh, easier to find in full bell lines, but harder to find in gym, sort of a paradox. So the gym coin uh, to me is not a good coin to buy without full bell lines here because you're almost paying the same amount of money. 51 S's um, are uh, difficult uh, to find full bell lines at gym. You're looking at a four to $500 coin where a regular gym is hundred bucks. Again, this is gonna be a trend for estimate coins. Very tough to find. 52's, not so hard in gym. That's gonna be a fairly common date type coin. A little tougher in 52 D. Still, I would call that a type coin. 52S, here's a big spread. You're looking at about 100 and 150 bucks for 65, but you're looking at an easy 1,000 to $1,200 or more for a full bell line. 53 is a, is a tougher date for Philadelphia, so you're looking at 130 bucks for a gem, about six to 700 bucks for full bell lines. Uh, and in 53D, uh, very easy to get full bell lines. That's gonna probably be one of your type coins. If not a 48, then it's gonna be like something like a 53D. They usually come really well and struck up. But a super tough coin to find at 67. Very tough. Um, 53S, uh, easy to find in gym. Virtually impossible to find with full bell lines. At the 63 level, you're looking at a five or six thousand dollar coin. The coin costs about in 65 about the same as a fully loaded Toyota Camry. So you're looking at about 30 grand for a 53S with full bell lines. And once you get to 66, you know you can almost double that. Uh, 54 is type coin and full bell lines. 54D, similar story. 54S is one of the easier S mints to get in gem. It's about a 50, 60 dollar coin, but full bell lines will set you about 200 to 300 bucks. Uh, another 55 is type coin. 56 is a type coin. 57 is a type coin. 58, uh, 57D also a type coin. A lot of the double mint sets produced in this period, and uh, you know, finding nice examples, especially nice toned examples, not too difficult. Even though a lot of those sets have not been broken up. Uh, so anyway, 48 is type coin. 48 or 58 type coin. 58D type coin. 59 uh, is uh, is more or less easy to find in gym, a little harder, and full bell lines, you're looking at about 150 to $200. Uh, 59D is a type coin, 60 is a type coin, 60D is about twice as hard to get actually than a 60. Uh, the the D-mints are, are get tougher as you get later in the series. Uh, so that's, a, that's about a $160, $180 coin in gym, and then about three to $300, $350 to $400 in full belt lines. 
Um, 61 is tough. Now the mint is working overtime to try to get like coins out. The mintages are going up, but the quality is going down. You can get a gem at about 80 to 90 dollars, but full bell line example is going to be over a thousand. And then at 66, you're talking about 10 to 12 thousand dollars for a nice full bell line coin. 61D uh, is uh, about twice as hard as the 61. Uh, except for the fact that the uh, full bell line example is about six or seven hundred dollars. So the gems are tougher, but they're more commonly found full bell lines. Still tough coin. 62, uh, 95 bucks for a gem, but you're looking at seventeen, eighteen hundred dollars for full bell line. 62D is about half that difficult. And 63, it's the same. It's pretty much the same. Easy to find though. In gem, you're looking at $50, $60 coin, but you're still at that $1,700, $1,800 level for full bell lines. And the series closes in, uh, with the Denver issue, uh, which is uh, you know about $40, $50 bucks in gem and $200 in full bell lines. So when you look at this, this is like 30 years of uh, market data, you know, driving these prices. Um, you know, there is no... There is no shortcut to finding these coins. You know, if, if people, if dealers had access to unlimited amount of Franklin half dollars, they would have submitted many of these full bell line examples uh, for encapsulation and, and then would have auctioned them off. So if coins are selling for $1,500, $2,000, $3,000 or more dollars in gem for full bell lines, it's a good indication that they're going to be very difficult to find. So what are my tips? Like I have some tips for you guys how you find these coins in the wild without buying them in holders and paying that premium. So my first tip is look at collections that come up in estate sales or, or especially collections that are original, that are 40, 50 years old, one owner coins, especially mint sets that are one owner mint sets. How can you tell? Well, usually the envelopes are in very good condition. The coins don't look like they've been taken out. They still have that, that sort of that freshness to them. They, the, the paper isn't well worn. Second thing to look for is again, look at the left side of that bell all the way to the crack. Use a loop, use good incandescent lighting, uh, and don't be hasty when you're looking at these coins. Uh, also, don't overthink it. Uh, if, if you are on the fence about whether it's a full bell on coin or not, um, I think that that's pretty much a good indication that you're trying to either convince yourself that it's not or you're trying to convince yourself that it is. And whatever side of the fence you are on, if you can make a logical uh, conclusion that, well, I really wish it was a full bell line coin, but that hit cuts it in half. I mean, that's telling you that it's not, and you're just kind of hoping for something. On the other hand, if you're looking at the coin and you can't see anything wrong with it, but you're trying to convince yourself that, oh, but if I submit this, it'll never get it because it's valuable. Well, you know, there is no like hidden agenda with this. This is not one of those very difficult to figure out uh, numismatic mysteries. The lines are there, they're not. So, um, so get fresh coins if you can. Take your time looking at the coin, but don't overthink it. The lines are there, they're not. The third tip I would have is look at coins and holders. Sometimes uh, these things get missed. And so anytime you see a nice coin, like a really nice coin that stands out, just take your time, look at it in the back of the holder. You will see, you know, very low percentage of the time that you'll find a coin that may, may be graded 65 that was really just borderline or the, maybe the graders missed it. And, you know, that that's a great way to cherry pick a coin that's that's a quality coin to begin with. But I think your best, your best bet is to, to buy fresh. I would not recommend that you uh, look for full bell line Franklin half dollars by buying uh, pre-owned mint sets off of internet sites like eBay, especially from uh, coin dealers or people who have traded in coins, have thousands of feedbacks for selling the similar types of items. Because anybody who's savvy enough to take good photos of a coin and put it up on eBay and sell thousands of coins and make a living off of it knows how to look at coins, will look at these coins, will pre-screen them and take anything that's worth getting graded uh, and get them graded. Also, on the other hand, don't trust any online auction where the auctioneer says, oh, you know, my great uncle had this big, big coin collection and I'm selling it and here's a bunch of like rando coins and because those stories never pan out either. It's a great 
oh, maybe I got this wonderful collection kind of like mystique to it, but it's all marketing. A real old time collection is like maybe something you find local or at an estate sale where somebody had coins, they collected them for a while and maybe they passed away and then the family's just selling some of their things. Um, you're not going to find online from professional sellers old collections that are, aren't sorted through, aren't cherry picked already. Um, let's just uh, imagine that we're going to go and collect coins and we're looking at the Franklin Half Dollar series and we're going to say, well, you know, I'm not going to cherry pick coins. I'm going to try to pick nice coins. I'm going to, I'm going to put a collection together. Should I buy graded coins or should I buy raw coins? So raw coin set in a Dansko or a Whitman album is a worthwhile pursuit. Um, many of the coins can be bought in mint sets, as I said. Coins can be raw, bought raw singles. Uh, they can be bought in circulated or uncirculated grades. I personally prefer the uncirculated coins for this series. And putting a nice album together is a great hobby. It could take... You know, you could spend a few months on it. Um, if you have a, a more limited budget, maybe even longer. It's the type of collection that a, a, even a youngster can collect because in, in most of the uncirculated grades, these coins aren't incredibly rare. Uh, silver is going up in price, but not to the point where these coins are going to be out of the reach of most people. Uh, there's nothing like looking at this full set. It's a nice length. It's not too short. It's not too long. There's some PD and S mint coins, and it's a really interesting period of time, 1948 to 1963. Um, I think that if you're going to buy raw and you want to put a set together, expect to spend between six and six hundred and a thousand dollars to complete the entire set. If you're going to buy certified coins, the price will go up by multitudes. But is it worth it? Now, honestly, I think that depends on your goals. If your goal is to simply look at and admire a coin, it's probably not worth it to buy certified examples. But if your point is to have specific types of coins and the specific uh, levels of preservation or, or look, like if you're looking for toning or brilliant coins, or if you're looking for coins that are full bell lines, then you have to go with certified coins. Uh, the certified coins typically will have most of the nicest coins available to the collector market. They will be looked at and observed by professionals uh, and they will be traded as such. Uh, a raw coin has the potential to be an MS66 or an MS65, but it isn't actually one as viewed by the industry until it's in a holder. So you have a coin that could be worth $150, $200, but it isn't until it's in that holder. And so that's the difference. So yes, you can have a great dance go album, cherry pick some nice coins. Those coins could be certainly worth more than your typical BU, barely uncirculated or barely used coins that you might find it, uh, you know, through whatever channels you buy your coins at. But they, they only have the potential of having a higher market value. They don't actually realize that market value until they're in a holder. Now you could take, let's just say I had a raw album full of 67 full belt line level Franklin half dollars, and I took them to a very knowledgeable specialist dealer, and I said, listen, I have this album of the best Franklin half dollars you've ever seen, and you're not getting them unless you pay a significant amount of money. Now that dealer with that level of knowledge will be able to look at your raw coins and determine that you're right, that these coins are all fantastic and that they would grade out and they would be worth a ton of money. Now he's going to mitigate his downside risk. He might even say, well, I'm going to go in with, on you, uh, or with you on this uh, at a certain level and I get this cut and you get that cut. But only that kind of dealer is going to take that kind of chance paying a significant premium for raw coins. Most dealers are not at that level of specialty. And although they can identify a coin that's going to be a gem or a choice coin, and typically will be able to identify a coin that's a full bell line coin or not, they're not going to sit there and take all the risk for themselves and submitting the coins and then having to market the coins and letting you get off scot-free. So keep that in mind. That is the difference between certified coins and uncertified coins. Um, and again, full bell lines.
for some dates, it's not a big deal. Like the 48s, the 49s, some of these dates, most of the coins come full bell lines. And if I was a collector who wasn't specifically interested in having a complete set of full bell line coins, if the premium is negligible between the full bell line strike and the non-full bell line strike, I would go with the full bell line coin. And I do, and I say that because like, you know, for a 48 or a 49, if you're selling it and it's not full bell lines and most people find that the full bell line coins are readily available, then you basically have a coin that checks only a couple of the boxes. But if, if you have it already and it didn't cost you a premium, there's no reason to like, you know, sweat it. 10, 15 bucks, just get the full bell line coin. Toners. Okay, so the Franklin half dollar being a 90% silver coin uh, has a lot of nice toning. Some coins are toned throughout, but they're not colorful terminal types of toning. They might just have that like brown or gold spatter across it. So the key when you're getting into toning is to realize a few things. One, throw the price guides out. They don't matter. Uh, to premium toned coins will sell for many multiples of the price guide. Two, certified coins only. Do not pay a premium for any toned coin that is not certified. If it's not certified and it's a premium toned coin, it or it looks like one, it probably has been uh, uh, either doctored or won't make it into a, a, a certified holder. Not every coin in a certified holder is natural toning, but it's very difficult to get an obviously artificially toned coin into a holder. The other thing to look at is compare. Let's try to find comps of all the different dates and the similar types of toning. Uh, Stacks Bowers, Heritage Auctions, uh, uh, and legend rare coin auctions. Uh, probably, I would say look at um, uh, if there's a if there's a, a high resolution photo of the coin available at any of the grading service websites. Look at comps. See what the comps are selling for. Uh, legend has made a market in selling high end Tone Morgan dollars. I think they get like record prices for these things. So go look at what their 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 upper tier coins are bringing with that kind of toning for those kinds of dates. And then once you get a feel for what it's going for, then you have a baseline. But use only that, use that as a baseline. What you need to do is to decide for yourself what that coin's worth to you. And, and so uh, if it's a, 50, uh, a 58P, which uh, is very easy to find really nicely toned examples, especially with that sort of watery kind of, uh, of luster. Uh, the first thing I would think about is this. Well, this is fairly easy to find tone, so I don't want to pay a super premium because there are a lot of toners out there. The second thing is, how nice is this toning? If it's like a red-green toning and there's a lot of them out there, then maybe I'm like not so excited about the coin. But if it's just an eye popping, like almost like a fluorescent or beautiful, rich blue kind of coloration, and it's like all throughout, and like I haven't seen one like this that's just really pops, well, then, then you have that emotional appeal, and you start to see, well, emotionally, I think this coin should be in my collection. I'm willing to pay well over what the comps are because I don't think this compares to those coins and I definitely have to have it. And that's going to be the psychology that dictates what the price is. And it's not just going to be your psychology, it's going to be the psychology of other bidders as well. I will tell you, when I went uh, through my uh, Ike dollar collecting phase, uh, there was a coin that priced out at $150, $160 in, in the grade of MS66. And the dealer that I was working with on the coin wanted a, almost a thousand dollars for it, and you know I hemmed in on I hauled about it, but eventually I'm like, all right, I bought it, um, and that was probably the dumbest thing I ever did because uh, well, not buying it, but selling it because I sold the coin, uh, and uh, the next time it showed up for auction, it sold for about eleven thousand uh, dollars because uh, it was uh, undergraded. And I let it go, uh, and I probably should have held on to it. But I, you know, it is what it is. So anyway, that's the thing. So what are the comps? What are the prices of the comps? How much do you like it? 
what can you afford? You know, obviously you're not going to go pay top dollar for something if you can't afford it. Um, I think the Franklin Half Dollar in Certified Grades is a great set for people who want to spend a hundred bucks, hundred fifty bucks a coin for gems. It's a great collect a set if you want to spend fifty or sixty bucks and get gems or MS sixty four type coins. And if you want to just be the guy who has the best coins that ever were struck or known in the series and you want to pay like big dollars for it, it's a nice, uh, it's a nice coin collection. The Franklin Half Dollar is one of the more popular modern coin series because it's so clean and so elegant. And 20th century coins, in our opinion, at Coin Week are going to be where the market shifts towards. Uh, in the next 30 to 50 years, it's going to be the primary place, I think, where people are collecting. And I see nothing but upside to 20th century U.S. coins. I think uh, we will have a real interesting hobby as more collectors start looking at, you know, the gold coins before 1933, the copper coins uh, before 1959, uh, the nickels from... Uh, let's just say the uh, 1913 uh, uh, through the through the 1960s when the mint mark was moved from the um, reverse to the uh, obverse uh, quarters, half dollars, uh, silver dollars, and whatnot. So this is to me the richest area of art and numismatics outside of the 18th century, and I think that um, for cherry pickers with varieties. Uh, and just for the overall aesthetics and looks of the coin, 20th century is going to be where it's at, folks. And um, that's my opinion. I'm sticking to it. So anyway, everybody who's in the comments, let me see if there's anything I can answer real quickly. I appreciate you guys putting up with the uh, putting up with any of the technical issues that I had. Uh, so uh, here we go. Let's see here. Um, Normies can afford. Well, you know what? Here's the thing about coin collecting, folks. It's for everybody. I mean, if they say it's the hobby of kings, but don't let that fool you. We spend money every day, and the money you don't spend is money you can collect. So, yeah, here's a, here's a Ben Franklin and the coins that normal people can collect. Uh, the depth of the line that can't be interrupted. Well, the line has to exist, and the depth of the line basically is does it exist throughout? I mean, if the line's there and it's delineated, uh, Coin Dragon, then it's the line. You know, the, the line isn't like sharp and deep. It's not like a ravine that goes across the coin, and it has to have that in order to make the des designation. It just has to be uninterrupted. Um, let's see. Uh, the MS uh, designation 66 should be deeper than 65. No, that's not really true natural uh, causes. 66 just means that the coin doesn't have as many hits or distracting marks as a 60 uh, as a 65. So the higher on the spectrum you go uh, up to the theoretical grade of 70 means that the coin is perfect as struck. And then each grade down is introduces flaws, planchet flaws, uh, contact marks, uh, different uh, distracting elements of it that take away from the original design as intended. So 65, uh, 30, 40 years ago, called Jim, was uh, interpreted as like, the, like a perfect collector grade. And as the grading has become more sophisticated and our tastes have, I would say, matured, but also our expectations have changed, it looks like that 66, 67 grade has become where people are expecting like flawless, nearly flawless, clean coins. And for circulation strikes, you don't see a lot of 67, 68 types of coins. Uh, usually these kinds of grades are reserved for things that were struck specifically for collectors. They weren't put in hoppers. They weren't banged around. Um, but yeah, so we, we if you collect Silver Eagles, you're not even looking for that anymore. You're looking for 70. Uh, and that's just the way these coins have been marketed to you as like this perfection. But once you start getting into circulated coins, the fact is perfection doesn't exist, but you're looking for as clean an experience as you can when you look at the coin. And that's what makes the coins really so interesting. It's like you know that there's a trade-off, that you're not going to have perfection, but you're looking for as clean and nice an experience as you can get. Uh, let's see if there's anything else here. Uh, 
Uh, my first Franklin proof from the crack in the bell is a scratch. Well, uh, I'm sure you weren't the first person to think that. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, cherry pick no less than 366 DDO penny hands were slabbed off eBay. Okay. Yeah, you can cherry pick varieties off eBay all day. That's true. But full bell lines, I don't know if you can so much anymore. Um, 54 proof Franklin 69 star in GC. I got it. Uh, that's a good coin there. I got it in a proof set uh, for 70 bucks last year. Well, that's a good. Did you dip that coin, Greg Quinn? Um, or did it come? Because a lot of those things come kind of hazy. Is $500 reasonable for a SEGS uh, holder at AU50 details clean 1883 Hawaiian Islands monster? I, I, I don't know, Corey. Uh, you know, Larry, Larry Brace is a, a professional numismatist. Um, and I, I believe that he's a you know pretty honest dude, but uh, I don't know if the SAGs holders really bring a lot of money in the market. And then as far as the uh, you know you start getting into details and stuff like that, um, you know you'd have to pretty much know what a, a non-detail coin would sell for, and then sort of price in what you think the you know what you think the uh, the damage to the coin has been. You know AU details means somebody has damaged it in some way. Um, so anyway, uh, that, that kind of does it. Uh, we're going to have some, uh, I'm going to be streaming uh, on the Newman portal. I think August 28, 29, we'll have details on Coin Week. I'm going to be doing a lecture on five things that the coin hobby can do to more or less modernize. Um, and uh, I, think, uh, I think we have a hobby that certainly reaches out uh, or can reach out better into the culture. Uh, the culture is talking about coins uh, and talking about money, and uh, we just uh, don't always observe it. Uh, shout out to uh, Run the Jewels, who uh, had a lot of uh, paper money and coin imagery in their latest song, Just. You can check that out. It's kind of a controversial song, and we debated whether or not we wanted to do a reaction video to it, but we only decided not to. But at the end of the day, Numismatics is everywhere, folks, and uh, and uh, I think uh, as our hobby uh, continues to evolve and younger people get into the hobby, I think we're going to bring more ideas about how the uh, how pop culture and how uh, our modern society uh, relates to money and how that relates to our hobby and collecting it. Um, People collect all sorts of things. Nobody would have thought when they were making transportation tokens so you could get on the New Jersey Turnpike that one day people would be collecting them. But that's the way it is. Uh, I did a stream a while back on a Chipotle uh, bur free burrito tokens. Like, you know, when those were made, nobody there thought that there would be a numismatic market for it and those tokens can sell for over $100 each. Uh, way more than a burrito, even though they keep raising their darn prices. So anyway, that's the way that's the way it is uh, around here. Um, tune in uh, next week. We have a cool podcast with Kevin Lipton where we're going to be talking about uh, the 1804 dollar. Uh, and then we got completely sidetracked uh, and we started talking about the modern coin market because Kevin Lipton made his name and his, his money selling uh, rare coins, 1804 dollars, things like that. But then he got into he got into modern coins and did it in a big way and transformed the market. So I kind of learned a little bit about what the under the, the behind the scenes uh, a wholesale element of the the modern coin marketplace is and how that developed. And uh, I want to share that information with you. We'll do that uh, next week on the Coin Week podcast. Uh, also check out our site. Uh, we have uh, reviews uh, from David Alexander of Cubert uh, Walker in my new book, The 100 Greatest Modern World Coins, which you should definitely check out. Please uh, check it out. If you like uh, world coins, I think you'll really enjoy it. Uh, and then uh, coming up soon, we're going to host the Numismatic Literary Guild Awards uh, for 2020. Normally, that was would be held at the ANA World Fair of Money. Uh, it'd be a big uh, to-do, uh, like a dinner gathering of some of the best writers in the industry. We're going to do it virtually this year. I have video uh, clips from uh, David Gantz, uh, Judge Coordinator, Ron Guff, the uh, Executive Director of the NLG. I was on the Board of Governors. Uh, I have uh, The new board is coming in, uh, actually, I think yesterday. 
So uh, we, we, we do the whole thing in a virtual setting where we announce all the winners uh, and we'll have a date for that soon as soon as, uh, as, soon as we get that video ready and the NLG uh, schedules the, uh, the, the program. So a lot of great stuff going on. Uh, numismatic industry is, is plugging along. Um, uh, Stacks, Bowers, and Heritage have had their big August sales, which would have been at the ANA. Some really big prices uh, on coins. Um, Stax Bowers just sold D. Brent Pogue's uh, Numismatic Book Library, which had some incredible books in it. Uh, a lot of nice coins have been sold. Um, and uh, it is uh, the market continues even as we're all stuck in our homes. So, anyway, I would like to thank you guys for stopping by. And for Coin Week, I'm Editor Charles Morgan. And I'll see you next week with another streaming news segment.